Good evening, everybody. Buenas noches, bienvenido, bienvenidas. Welcome, everyone. My name is Gabriela Ramirez Vargas. I am the assistant director of the Ronald H. Brown Law School Prep Program here on campus. I'm also an adjunct lecturer at the Latin American Latina Latino Studies Department. Um, before we officially open our event, I would like to thank you all for coming and being here with us tonight. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsors and our guests. At this time, I would like to provide a very special warm welcome to our keynote speaker, uh, former Special Rapporteur of Violence Against Women, Rashida Manju, who's here straight from Cape Town, South Africa. Our sponsors, uh, the Wales Assembly of Women, the United States Clergy Task Force, Persons Against Non-State Torture, for making this event possible. The CUNY Black Male Initiative, with its director, Dr. Jermaine Wright and Mr. Sean Best. The Ronald H. Brown Program, the University of Houston Pre-Law Pipeline Program, the Department of Latin American Studies, the Department of Africana Studies, the JJC Student Council, and the JJC Faculty Student Engagement Program. Okay. So I would like to now officially <coughs> open the panel discussion entitled, Making the Case for a New Legally Binding Treaty to Eliminate Violence Against Women and Girls. I will now turn the floor immediately to Rashida Manju, the professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and as I mentioned previously, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women between the years of 2009 and 2015. Thanks, Gabriela, and thank you very much to all of you for being here. I'm glad it's not snowing because otherwise we would have um, had fewer people in the room. But it does, you know, your presence here indicates the concern that many of us feel. Violence against women, in terms of all its manifestations, is the most pervasive human rights violation that we face today. Whether in times of peace, conflict, post-conflict, transitions, displacements, cri other crises like natural disasters, etc., And there is that acknowledgement, finally, that this is a human rights issue. For a long time, a violence against women is considered a social problem, considered as a health issue. The consequences, of course, social consequences, health consequences, but for a long time, the naming of violence against women as a human rights violation in and of itself was absent. Unfortunately, despite the rhetoric that violence against women is a human rights violation, the reality is that there is not um, a move in the international community to acknowledge this through legally binding, by imposing legally binding obligations on states. So for six years that I served as the mandate holder, I was like a broken record talking about the normative gap in international law. Um, and the normative gap is simply under international human rights law, there is no legally binding obligations on member states of the United Nations to, uh, to prevent uh, violence against women, to, um, uh, to, to eliminate violence against women, or to respond in any way. The International uh, Convention, on, um, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, as some of you may have studied, does not have a provision that addresses the issue of violence against women broadly. It has one article, Article 6, which is on trafficking and sex work. Now, it's a 1979 treaty. We cannot pretend that 1979 violence against women wasn't an issue in the global agenda. In 1980, finally, at a meeting, at an international meeting, a UN-sponsored international meeting in Copenhagen, it was the Second World Conference on Women after the 1975 Mexico meeting. At the Copenhagen meeting, finally, there was an acknowledgement that domestic violence, so it's in a very narrow form, just domestic violence, uh, is a, a global problem that should be of concern to the international community. At the UN level, what is called soft law, these resolutions and declarations are soft law, they're not legally binding on member states. A resolution was passed acknowledging domestic violence as a pervasive social problem, a social problem. 
And over the years, the permutations have been, this is a health issue, this is a criminal justice issue, and finally we get to a point where it is now acknowledged, and we see this in resolutions uh, of the UN, that this is a human rights issue. So despite that acknowledgement, we do not have international law, so there is no legally binding obligation on states to prevent, protect against, and to uh, respond to violence against women in all its manifestations. Um, CEDAW, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, to fill the gap, to fill the normative gap. A normative gap is a standard setting, a normative is a standard setting, which then imposes obligations once, once a state signs and ratifies, came up with general recommendations. General recommendations are the interpretation of a treaty monitoring body to encourage and educate member states. But it's not legally binding because states have not, states have signed on to the main body of the treaty but not to the general recommendations. So there's general recommendation 12, general recommendation 19, the latest one is General Recommendation 35, which expands on General Recommendation 19. So not legally binding, so still not imposing legally binding obligations on states. Um, other human rights monitoring bodies have looked at different uh, aspects of violence against women, domestic violence, sexual violence, etc., and made either general recommendations or concluding observations and comments in their work. So, as a lawyer, my frustration was that I was trying in my reports, my thematic reports, my country mission reports, um, trying to hold states accountable using soft law. And that's frustrating for a lawyer because black letter law is what we look at and then look at what are the remedies, where's the violations, what is the state responsibility, how do we hold the state accountable. So you're constantly referring to a declaration which is not legally binding, you're referring to resolutions, etc. And my frustration led to me holding regional consultations. So I wrote a thematic report on state responsibility to, um, uh, to, to address the problem of violence against women and girls. And um, using um, state responsibility to act with due diligence. And my argument is that the state has a dual responsibility. The state has a responsibility to the individual that's been harmed, but the state has a responsibility to have an effective, responsive, functioning, sustainable system in place. So we don't have the conversation over and over again about state failures to protect and prevent harm and prevent human rights violations. And so that was my thematic report as one way of getting the world, the international community, to look at the issue. There have been other reports, including one on gender-related killings of women, where my argument is that the killing of a woman is the ultimate act of violence in a continuum of violence. So states are failing to prevent, to respond appropriately to other acts of violence which eventually lead to a woman being killed because this woman is in the system. She's in the health system, she's in the social welfare system, she's you know, in the justice system, but the state is failing and ultimately women are dying and the statistics are reflecting that more women are dying. And I think the current US statistic is 20 women a day die at the hands of people that they know, intimate partners, etc. And But it's a growing problem globally. So the thematic reports try to kind of get governments to acknowledge we have a problem, they're not being held accountable, and they're not acting uh, in, uh, you know, in terms of soft law obligations that they have. So I held consultations in different parts of the world and there was an overall responsiveness that we need to fill the normative gap. Part of the challenge of international law is it's very male-centric, right? Uh, not many women are at the table when negotiations are going on about treaties, etc., because a lot of the diplomatic core is male. So there is an absence of women at the table trying to push uh, for reform, but there's also a backlash against women's rights that we see globally for those of us at work, you know, either within the UN system or with the UN system, we can see the backlash as well. And it's as if women have too many rights already and we don't need to address this. But states are quite happy to talk about violence against women being a, 
a per pervasive, widespread human rights violation. So my regional um, consultations reveal that there is, people are responsive, there is a need. I then um, produce reports where I highlight both, because I used to report to the Human Rights Council in Geneva and the General Assembly in New York, that, that there is a normative gap clearly and the international community needs to look at this. I finished my, uh, my term in uh, 2015, in July of 2015, and my successor um, in 2017 produced a report, and she doesn't talk about the normative gap, she talks about the ad uh, adequacy of the frameworks. So in her view, and she had been a former CEDAW committee member, that the problem is twofold. One is uh, there's an implementation gap. The problem is not necessarily a normative gap, that the interpreta interpretive work of treaty bodies has contributed to what is now considered customary international law. Ask any technical black letter international law lawyer and they'll tell you that this isn't so. It, customary international law is not applicable in the violence against women sector because it doesn't meet the test of what cons constitutes customary international law. So she, she she posed five questions on her website for people to send submissions, including a question on do you consider that there is a need for a separate legally binding treaty on violence against women? Would a separate monitoring body, which is what I was arguing for in my reports. Uh, she received many responses. Um, strangely, for those of you that work with the regional human rights systems, and I suppose it's not strange, people are territorial even in human rights bodies. So the regional human rights systems, the inter-American, um, the European system, not the African system, I can proudly say that, but the, re the European and the inter-American system basically were, non were not very positive that we need to address the normative gap because they have specialized treaties. The European system has the new Council of Europe Convention on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. The inter-American system, of course, is the first regional human rights system that has a specific treaty on violence against women, the Bellum de Para. And so the responses from CEDAW and the um, working group on discrimination against women in the UN system uh, basically were arguing that there's no normative gap, we don't have to do anything. The special rapporteur on women in the African human rights system said, yes, we, there is a normative gap that we need to address. But the interesting submissions were actually from civil society. So 291 responses from civil society globally. And in general, they argue that they are concerned about the soft law and non-binding nature of the current UN framework, that normative and implementation gaps do uh, exist, that substantive gaps and incon inconsistencies in the current frameworks is a source of concern, there's fragmentation, cooperation issues, etc., between the regional and the international system. And of course, none of that filters into the domestic system because when you have international law, the, the goal always is that it permeates down into the domestic system, that our state systems, our national country level systems are strengthened because there's a, a framework, a normative framework, a binding normative framework. So the, you know these concerns came up and some of the civil society interventions are on the website. We are not sure why not all were posted on the website and it's been a source of concern because there should be transparency by a UN independent expert to put all the views out there. Um, despite the level of support for by the, through these um, submissions that were received for a specific standalone legally binding treaty, the current special rapporteur does not support this view. She says we need other solutions which might, in, might include in some way forward a new optional protocol to CEDO in the long term, not now. Uh, a global roadmap and implementation plan on preventing and combating violence. And my question is, what are the norms and standards that would inform a roadmap and an implementation plan? What are we implementing if there are no legally binding obligations on states? Um, she also looks at developing more guidelines. Now, we don't need more soft law, is my view, and my reports argue this. What we need is to start holding states accountable. 
for a pervasive human rights violation. So the challenge that we face within the UN system is there's states, and I mean, you know, you, you've learned this in your human rights courses. The UN is a government of governments. We need to acknowledge that. They work in their interests, right? So those diplomatic people that sit in the UN, they represent both their national level interests, but also protecting under the guise of state sovereignty and other issues. So it's a government of governments that will work in their interests. And how do we influence and shape them to think differently? That it's not enough, soft law is not enough, articulating that you know, you're concerned about the prevalence and the widespread nature of violence against women is, is um, just the rhetoric is not enough. We need to move beyond that because the reality is more women are dying. We're seeing the exacerbation post-conflict, post-disasters. We're seeing an exacerbation. The statistics are going up. We're seeing more and more girls being impacted. And it's just reflecting what has happened in the lives of their grandmothers, their mothers, etc. But states are not being held accountable for this pervasive human rights violation. Now, if this was a global medical epidemic, you know, we would declare violence against women, uh, um, a, we would declare a state of emergency globally, right? Because it's an epidemic. The World Health Organization describes violence against women as an epidemic. It is an epidemic. So why are we not holding states accountable to respond to, to protect against, and to prevent violence against women through legally binding obligations. So we've reached a stage, I think, in human rights discourse that we have to start talking about accountability and substantive equal, uh, accountability, not just, okay, you can produce a report every four years to a treaty body, but a different kind of accountability that sends a message. You know, We can't do enforcement, of course. With UN treaty bodies, they don't have enforcement powers. We need an international human rights court to be doing more of this, like we have an international criminal court. Uh, and until we get there, for me, a legally binding instrument to start holding states accountable through reporting, through having a function of uh, uh, being able to entertain individual complaints, but also strengthening an inquiry process in a treaty, but a separate treaty with its own monitoring body. So that's my dream. I, am, I do sound like a broken record, and many of the people on this panel, my term's over, but many of the people on this panel are keeping the issue alive, and Cheryl Thomas also is from Minnesota, keeping the issue alive on pushing the international system that we cannot, um, just because this impacts women and girls, it doesn't mean that we can devalue it and we can continue to have, excuse me, soft law development. So thank you very much, and you will hear more from the others about why it is so crucial that we take up this battle um, on having a, a separate treaty on violence against women that can hold states out. Thank you very much, Rashida, for that great explanation for our students. I'm pretty sure that gave them a great explanation of your work and everything that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but now, uh, I just want to let you guys know we have distributed all of the impressive bios from our panelists. You have them all in your booklets. Uh, I'm not going to read them over. You can read them over on your own time, so that way we could spend our time with our panelists and we could get to a question and answer. Um, so in terms of how this will be working, so panelists, uh, you all have 10 minutes each. I will do my best to keep you more or less on track. Um, and then once that's over, we'll go into a 30-minute question and answer. So students, I highly encourage you to make, uh, have questions for our panelists, right? They're the experts, this is your moment. Um, but a little bit going forward, uh, I did a little bit of research and of course, as Rashida was saying, and I'm sure the rest of the panelists are gonna go over, this is a very tough topic. Um, and I was looking at numbers in terms of non-state torture and non-state uh, violence against women. And the latest numbers I came up with were from a report from the International Labor Organization in collaboration with the Walk Free Foundation and International Organization for Migration. And these are numbers from September 2017. 
and they're estimating that around 40 million people around the world are victims of human trafficking. Okay, so that's a lot of people. Out of those 40 million, they're estimating that 29 million, or 71%, are women and girls. Okay. Women also represent close to 99% of forced sex labor and 84% of forced marriages around the world. Many of these underage, they're girls. Of course, these statistics vary a lot due to lack of resources, due to culture, um, and it's estimated that around 35% of women worldwide have experienced some type of physical or sexual abuse from an intimate partner. So somebody that they've been in a relationship with, right? Um, but I think something that we're gonna be talking about in this panel, uh, we're gonna focus a lot on rural women. And in some countries, the statistics for intimate sexual abuse, physical abuse, could go up to 70% of the women experiencing this. Um, so I think we have some great panelists here that we're go they're gonna go deeper into this. And something that's very deep to me is the fact that we're gonna have the opportunity to talk about Puerto Rico in terms of an international forum and seeing it as a case study in terms of how domestic violence goes up after natural disasters such as Hurricane Irma, such as Hurricane Maria, that hit within a two-week period. Um, and I thank you, Professor Ray, for bringing that to this panel. Um, in addition to that, as a global society, I think we've become more increasingly aware of the need to improve local, national, and global mechanisms to protect women and girls, including the need for a new legally binding treaty, which is why we're here, right? We're advocating for a legally binding treaty at the international level. And our very knowledgeable panelists will discuss this further, they'll give you examples and some great recommendations that we can use going forward. Okay, uh, thank you and let us begin. So right now I'm gonna turn the floor over to Linda McDonald, co-founder of nonstatetorture.org, scholar and human rights advocate. So that was lovely, Gabriella. I find it very moving to um, hear young people talk about the prevalence of violence against women. It's, it's good for my heart to hear that. It's a sad story, but it's important that we have to carry it on from generation to generation. So I'm Linda McDonald from Nova Scotia, Canada, and Jean and I, Jean's on the far left there, you're right. We uh, work with survivors of non-state torture, and we have for 25 years. And over those 25 years now, we've heard from over 5,000 women from all around the world. So I always tell people that so they understand how many voices we have heard and how many voices really are in this room that have not been heard really uh, globally yet because it's still a very invisible crime. And that's such a tragedy in, in 2018. So we'll tell you our story why the, the, uh, we need a new treaty for these women. Okay. So what is non-state torture? Um, it's torture, the same as state torture, except that it's done by different people. State torture is done by the military, the police, an embassy, and non-state torture is perpetrated by parents, by neighbors, by friends of the family, by traffickers, by pornographers, by prostitute uh, pimps and buyers. Those are the main perpetrators. And um, it's a terminology, non-state torture was invented uh, or coined by Amnesty International. And it's a global term that is still new to many people, not to Jean and I so much, but it's, it's still new to the world. So we have to grow into that term. Because really, I'm a very strong feminist. And naming, if, any, if there's any other feminists in the room, we know how important naming is. And the women all tell us that their suffering is not, you know, it's not abuse. It's not assault, it's not anything but torture. So in order for them to heal, their, their suffering has to be named properly, and the law has to be named properly in order for it to become visible with data and research and treatment in society. So the naming is very important. Now if you look at, this is a model that Jean and I developed to show around our country of Canada. We have a law against state torture in our country, but not against non-state torture. And our argument is the exact same uh, acts of torture are perpetrated on women and girls the same as they are in the state realm. So if you look at electric shocking, 
burning, whipping, uh, water torture, uh, starvation, drugging, gang raping. Those are all things that we've heard from Abu Ghraib, but they're also the same tr atrocities that Jean and I hear that happen in little girls' bedrooms or in the basement in their home or taken to a hotel. And remember, they start when they're infants often, the women that we've, we've talked to. So it even makes it more of a crime in my mind that infants have to endorse, endorse such atrocities and we're still misnaming it as something other than uh, torture. So we say that it's a patriarchal divide and there's a discrimination in our country and in most countries because most countries in the world do not have uh, laws against non-state torture. In the United States, there's a, a, crime, or a law in Michigan and one in California and Alabama. And I think sexualized torture in Florida, but I'm not sure about that. But your country is, is evolving the same as all countries in the world. Rwanda has a law against non-state torture. Uganda has a law. And, you know, our country thinks that we're pretty far ahead, but we're not far ahead around non-state torture. So this is another model that Jean and I developed to kind of give you the three categories of non-state torture. The first one is the classic torture, and that's the one that I just described. And I don't know if you heard about the girls, the children in California that were held captive for 27 years. Um, we don't know yet what happened to them in detail, but some of these things happened to them. And the, the women that we work with, they talk about being caged. That's a very common, caged in the basement, shackled or, or uh, hung in the basement, tied in the basement. It's, it's amazing what you can do in your own home when you're the parent and you have power over, over the children. And the category two is the commercial-based torture, non-state torture, and that's what Gabrielle was talking about with the human trafficking and pornography and snuff movies. Do you know what snuff is? It's a filming of a murder on live online, or, or you can sell the movies. They're very profitable to sell. Um, and migrant workers, there's a torture involved with them around um, the domestic employment. And prostitution as well. That's one of the arguments that Jean and I have about uh, prostitution. We can't see it as work because so many of the women talk about being tortured, and torture really is not work. And then FGM and acid burning and widow burning are all under the social cultural norms, and the United Nations has already recognized them as forms of torture. So why do torturers do what they do? We're always asked that question, and people are pr pretty shocked. Are these things that you've heard before, or is this a new reality for you? New, sort of. Well, the pleasure is the big one. That's the one that most people miss. But if you have a, a child in your total control and you want to destroy a person's sense of self, if you're a sado, masochistic parent, then you have pleasure in knowing that you have ultimate control of that child and you can destroy their sense of self. It's the opposite of a caring parent. We just have to understand that some parents are good parents and some parents are horrible parents. So they have prestige, they, ha they gain profit with the trafficking and the prostituting, and they also can gain power and control. This is a case example. Uh, the woman on the top is a woman that Jean and I worked with. She is now dead, but she, she unfolded her horrific story and um, she was uh, reduced to being called a piece of meat. She was held captive for four and a half years. And she's a classic example of the goal of the torture, which is to destroy the sense of self. And this man, William, William Sampson, he was also um, tortured by the state. And he said that it really did destroy his sense of self. He eventually died of a heart attack from the trauma of the, of the torture, and he wrote a book about it. So there is a difference between abuse and torture. Because Lynn, the woman I told you about that was reduced to a piece of meat, when she married this man, he started abusing her. And for the six months, he would uh, beat her and uh, choked her. Um, but then after six months, he decided that he'd probably gained enough control of her. And he said, let's go to Ontario and we'll start a new life. And she thought that sounded great. But indeed, what he did is he took her and held her captive for four and a half years. Uh, trafficking her and prostituting her. And these are all of the, uh, the uh, acts of torture that Lynn endured. And she held this quiet for 20 years, 25 years, until she met me as a care coordinator in her, in her home and 
uh, I asked her whatever caused her to be so angry, and she, for the next two years, told Jean and I her story. So you'll see, I mean, she had phalangia, which is a classic beating the soles of the feet that we hear about in state torture, if you're doing any uh, law research in state torture. And she had five forced abortions. Um, she uh, was raped with knives and guns. Gang rape being is very common. So I don't know how anyone could call that assault, but that's what our country calls it. And that's where we say the discrimination comes from. This is another woman that Jean and I work with, and these are her own drawings. The one at the top is um, her when she was a little girl of two, sitting on the, the counter of her dad's store. And men would just come in lines to rent her. And she, was, she sat there on the cash register just like he'd sell candy to someone. And she just, that's all she ever knew till she met us. She also was involved in uh, forced into pornography and, and trafficked um, across international boundaries, not just uh, local. M many of the, the uh, trafficking that we're talking about is international. They, they can be come from North America and end up in Prague or different countries. And the pornography that was made by her family was home-based pornography. And it was used as an educational tool as well to train um, boys, they train the boys to become perpetrators. So they would use the pornography for that reason. Bestiality was included as well. I know these are terrible things, but in order for you to understand what we're talking about when we say non-state torture, we have to describe it because otherwise people wouldn't imagine a lot of these, these uh, ordeals. And the last slide I have here is Sarah, she endured 23,980 rapes by the time she was 20. So that's a horrendous amount of rapes, and uh, that's where our argument comes from. The sexualized torture is rampant in non-state torture, and any woman that has to endure 20,000 or 24,000 or however many in 20 years, I cannot say that they were assaulted or that they were abused. We have to start understanding that women and girls are enduring torture at a much more prevalent rate than we, we do recognize today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. And now we would like to continue with your co-founder, Jean Sarson. No? no? Okay. Sorry. Sorry, it changed a little bit. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go, sorry about that, with Jeanette. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'd like a show of hands, if I may. Uh, how many of you are law enforcement or going to be law enforcement? Okay. <clears throat> how many are going to be attorneys? Mm-hmm. How many are going to be prosecutors? <laughs> Jiminy Crickets. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, we do need a few of those. Um, I was very fortunate to have had uh, really good police officers, really good attorney represent me in a court of law. This was 1992. And basically, the tortures that Linda McDonald were talking about here, I've experienced many of those, including uh, the filming of myself being tortured and raped. It's called child pornography. That is the pictorial record of crimes being committed against children. That's what that is. And actually, prosecutors really like those kind of cases because you do have that pictorial record. But the pornography made of me as a child, it was eight millimeter. Today, child pornography is transferred to the latest and greatest forms of technology and repackaged and sold on the market. As a matter of fact, the uh, child pornography, of father-daughter incest, that is the gold standard. That brings the most money. 
because of the power differentiation, the ultimate power, the ultimate betrayals. So I'd like to, to read something to you. I didn't read this this morning on a panel, but I'd like to read this to you. It's something I wrote called, They Say I Look Okay. They say I look okay because I'm not dead from a knife to my throat and a gun to my head <clears throat> as I ran away again at age 16, picked up on Interstate 65 by the Dayton Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. No mind that my first runaway was at age four due to torture, incest, rape, father, uncle, cousins, and, those, and other so-called family members and not related perpetrators. They say I look okay, even though I failed the first grade, had speech delays, and a tested IQ of 80 points by the second grade. I spoke gibberish from the drugging and the ongoing abuse and torture, all of it recorded on eight millimeter. They say I look okay, as strange men picked me up from my elementary school for more of the same. They say I look okay as I'm traded for political favors, flown out of state to Ohio, New York, to the well-to-do John perpetrators and pedophiles in nice hotels where not-so-nice criminal activities take place. They still say I look okay at age 24, my last hands-on trafficking, torture. Never mind that I promptly had my second major emotional breakdown and dropped out of my freshman year of school, 1978, and began a three-year run of homelessness, living with friends, acquaintances, drug dealers, just to keep running, running, running. They even said I looked okay, even sounded okay, after my marriage at age 28 to a, whole, a really, a true hero, who listened as I cried, dissociated, and otherwise broke down. As for the first time in my life, I was safe enough to tell of my 24 years of horror and torture and complete loss of any meaningful relationships with my mother, also an abused woman, married a child bride at age 15, a woman who became insane instead of survive, and the loss of my also abused siblings, a complete and utter family destruction that ensured no normal or meaningful relationships could take place if I want to keep looking and sounding okay. After 14 years of therapy to put my shattered self back together, they said I finally looked okay enough to be vocationally rehabilitated and to finish a college degree. Today I have a master's degree. But then in 1992, I didn't look or sound okay enough to get justice and hold my perpetrators accountable, according to the district attorney and the grand jury, a slice of justice that they tried to deny me, but they were not successful in doing. As I became aware, there were no statute of limitations on felony crimes in the state of Kentucky. And I would hold at least one of my perpetrators accountable and of course out many of the others that I knew. I held perpetrators accountable for violating my basic human rights. Now it was and it is the perpetrators who don't look or sound okay as they are outed in the news behind closed and open doors and otherwise exposed in their Armani suits. Today, I am looking, sounding, and feeling okay, not perfect, 
and not expecting perfection. Today, I speak at the United Nations. I bring my sister survivors with me to speak and tell their truths, to let the world know that we, the exploited, the prostituted, the tortured, will not remain silent. We will do more than just survive, we will thrive. And we will transcend the abuse, the poverty, and the social injustice from which we came. So, after a three-year journey through the criminal justice system, and I can tell you this, I didn't get a whole criminal justice pie. But I got a slice, and that slice goes a long way to restoring faith in humanity. In 2007, a special rapporteur on violence against women took my confidential report to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. My detailed report on the torture, prostitution, pornography, trafficking, and human rights violations that I suffered from infancy to age 24 years at the hands of protected perpetrators both known and identified and unknown and unidentified. I detailed the human rights violations and the personal consequences of my exploitation in the document standing firmly on Articles 2, 4, and 5 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Committee on Torture, and all articles of CETA, but specifically Article CETA, uh, Article 6 of CETA that addresses trafficking and prostitution. By the way, those of us who have been prostituted, we absolutely do not use the word sex work. We don't think it is work for any human being, male, female, child, or other. It is a form of exploitation. It's inherently violent. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, <clears throat> tortured and prostituted women that I put on air in Louisville, Kentucky, on a gra grassroots uh, radio show, I'm one of the radio programmers. I call it the human factor, not to be, um, don't think it's uh, Bill O'Reilly or anything like that. It's the human factor. And so I provide a platform for these abused and tortured women to talk about what has happened to them. And in fact, isn't, you know, training a lot of these survivors how to get through the criminal justice system or the criminal injustice system. The system often has doors don't enter, you can't, don't, nobody's going to believe you, we're invisibilized. Just as what Linda, uh, those 13 children in California that Linda talked about, that is a case of non-state torture. And I can tell you, I, I hope that they are going to be restor restored um, to the point where they can live a life as I have been restored. But I can tell you, it was 14 years of intensive therapy. Who's going to pay for it? If we don't provide the funds and the resources, all of us are going to pay for it. And we can pay for the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. But I think that if we look at what Rashida is saying here, if we listen to what Jean and Linda are talking about, this idea that we can't make laws and that we can't stop this carnage is, is absolutely not true. In the 80s, when I began searching, I couldn't find anything that made sense to me, any 
thing. We, we didn't speak words like human trafficking and torture at the time. <clears throat> but I did find one body of research. It was research on the Holocaust. There, I had some understanding. I really, really think a book by Primo Levi, a survivor of the Holocaust, was incredibly helpful because it was the first time I saw anything that sounded or looked like anything that I had experienced. And I was not talking about that. I spent a whole year in a survivor's group and I didn't say one word to anyone. Two times I've been electively mute because I feared speaking the unspeakable, but it came a point when I couldn't keep running. It was going to be the perps or it was going to be me. And fortunately, I had some great police detectives. They all supported me. They went into the Commonwealth's attorney's office with me. I provided them with lots and lots of documentation. And guess what? Those of you that are going to be attorneys and law enforcement officer, you are going to be trained to be separate from us, separate from us survivors, when in fact, we are the witness. You know, we're not treated as that we're, we're doing it for me. We're, we're a witness for the state, witness for a case. OK, I accepted that finally. And actually, I had training by an FBI agent that instructed me on how to do this. The first thing I did was hire my own attorney to watchdog the system that was supposed to be working my case. OK, I wasn't going to be thrown under the bus. But there's some things that I learned to do. Survivors, in fact, are your best resource for building a case. Many of the things that you need to build a case, school records, uh, hospital records, mental health records, can really only be obtained by us due to confidentiality laws and HIPAA laws. You'll be trained to be separate with us. But no, join with us if you want to make these cases successful. Don't listen when they say they're too difficult, not enough evidence. You can't because you can. I have and others have. In 1992, I gave a complete videotaped history of all of this to um, the Attorney General in Kentucky outlining all of this, and it really made an impact. And out of that came some new laws. Today, in talking about non-state torture, I've joined hands with Jean and Linda, helping them forward um, non-state torture, because it has to be recognized instead of invisibilized. The same way, since Jody, your uh, instructor, here today talked about Puerto Rico, what's going on down there. Well, isn't Puerto Rico invisibilized? The things that are going on there? Okay, I can only imagine what perpetrators and traffickers, it is the perfect storm for them to swoop down and make a deal. I'll get you out of Puerto Rico. I'll get you and your kids out of Puerto Rico. Here's a ticket for you. And it'll probably be a ticket to hell. OK, those are the types of things that are external. But make no mistake about it, when we talk about non-state torture, you got to get away from the idea that all parents are OK. They're not all OK. Look at 13 children in California that for literally for decades were tortured, shackled, raped, God only knows what else, starved for sure, 29-year-old who weighed 52 pounds. And everyone said, 
they didn't see anything and they didn't know. Through non-state uh, torture, what we're really talking about is home-based Holocaust, is what we're talking about. And we need to support these brave people, Jackie Jones, a, a brilliant human rights attorney from Wales, Rashida, a, a former special rapporteur. We need to support these folks that understand what we're talking about here and really, if you look at these cases, you'll come to understand as well and why it's so necessary to really ratify it, this extreme violence. And I thank you for listening tonight. Thank you, Janet, so much. I gave you a few extra minutes because I think you were giving really good advice to our future lawyers, police officers, detectives. Um, and thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, so now I would like to turn the floor back to Jean Sarsen. Uh, she is the co-founder together with Linda McDonald of the Non-State Torture, uh, People Against Non-State Torture. Okay. How are you all doing? <laughs> You're okay? Okay, I'm gonna carry on from um, where Linda left off. Um, Jeanette was talking about the victimization and I just want to bring in a little bit. If you're a lawyer or if you're a police person, how you're going to understand victimization. We often talk about trauma, but we have to also know, uh, like Jeanette was mentioning, what victimization may be. So these are just a few slides about what Linda and I over the last 25 years have seen as quite normal responses for someone who has experienced and survived uh, non-state torture. So when they're healing, um, they can have all kinds of body talk all over again. That means that when they start remembering what they've endured, their body starts telling them a whole story of what their torture was. So for example, I'll give you a very brief example. I was sitting uh, with a woman and all of a sudden she went into a reenactment of being electric shocked. So she said to me, my heart is racing. So I said to her, well, I'll take your pulse. I took her pulse and it was 72, normal. And she said, do you see all the electric shocks flying? I said, no, I can't see anything. So the point is, what she was experiencing was way back when she was seven years old. And when in the present day, she was um, uh, reenacting what she had endured over this one specific electric shocking ordeal, she was re-experiencing as if it had happened right now. So if you're a lawyer or if you're a police person, you have to kind of know what is normal for people if they're coming out of uh, torture. So that was one example, and that's just the body, and every part of their body that's been hurt can be, um, it's like going through the torture all over again. Now the drugging, um, this is another example. We've seen all these um, responses, the drowsiness, the slurred speech, eyes drop. Linda and I were in a restaurant one day with a woman who was talking because they, it's really important to go where they feel comfortable and all of a sudden her head dropped on the table. So if you don't know, that can be quite normal and the drugging can be, it's a response to the drugging from long ago. You may not even, you may think, there's, what's wrong with her? You know, is she, is she fainting? Is she abnormal in some way? We've seen blindness and uh, paralysis over a couple hours too before we could help them come through it. The issue of hearing voices, um, that's another sensory flashback. Whose voices do they hear? They've been told over and over and over again 
they're, they're a slut, that they're no good, they're not worth anything, and they're not supposed to think. So if we don't know that they can be repeating what they've been told their worth, which is worth nothing, then it's the perpetrator's voice that they're telling you, not their own voice. So they have to learn to tell their own story, have their own voices. So it's these are just very quick um, responses. The whole idea of sensory shutdown, they have to do that to survive. So often they'll tell you they do not see in color. They'll see in black and white or gray. So that's part of survival. But if you're a policeman or if you're an attorney and you're trying to have them tell their story, if you don't understand this, you're going to misinterpret what might be, what they might be trying to tell you. Uh, now, I learned something earlier today from Rashida. I have femicide up there, and Rashida explained to the panel this morning that in South, in Africa, African countries, they use gender killing. Is that what you were saying? The term femicide, feminicide, yeah. would not resonate with them. With them. Yeah. So that's something I learned, um, depending on where you are culturally, that it may not uh, make sense. However, the people that Linda and I have known, many of them as children were taught to kill themselves. They were taught if they slit their wrists or somehow ran away and, and, never, and disappeared somewhere, that they should um, die. So that... Uh, suicidal psychological uh, torture can run with them their whole life if we don't deal with it. So here again, it's that idea that the suicidal misogynistic fe uh, femicide I have there is not their own doing, it's what they've been taught. So we have to understand that too if we're going to deal effectively. And vicarious trauma, if any of you have um, talked about vicarious trauma, often it's related to the people who are listening, whether you're police persons, whether you're attorneys, whether you're social workers, they often think that what we're listening, we're going to have the vicarious trauma. But you have to remember, if you're disassociative and you're hanging on the ceiling looking down at that person down there, that's not you. But as you heal, you come down to understand that is you. So they have vicarious trauma, and we have to understand that. So Article 5, um, Linda and I have practiced this for 25 years. Whoops. We, oft, we came uh, initially from the fact that the Charter of the United Nations talks about equality between men and women. And the Universal Declaration says, Article 5 says, no one shall be subjected to torture. And this is one time that women uh, and girls have to know they fit under the category of no one. Um, patriarchal and governmental and personal ways, that the language we use that can dismiss in a flash that a person has been harmed. And these are some of the languages um, terms that Linda and I have heard. A state may say that um, torture that is uh, perpetrated by the state is more important. So it's a state-centric uh, perspective. That, and Rashida has talked to you about soft law. They say it doesn't matter. It's soft law, so we don't have to do anything as a state. So that dismisses, that would dismiss uh, Jeanette's um, complaint in a flash. You know, if it was a recommendation from CEDA based on, say, recommendation number 19. The fact that it's redundant uh, in Canada, Linda and I have been told it's redundant to request that our country look at the issue of non-state torture. And, of course, the women who we work with tell us that that's an insult to their dignity, that it doesn't matter. Uh, this, the fact that assaults will do, just like Jeanette said, that's inappropriate to misname somebody's victimization. And those are some uh, other quick ones. The fact that it's only symbolic or you can't prove intentionality 
or the law won't be used, or lawyers won't use it because it's too hard, it's easier to do, um, say, an assault case. So for Linda and I, this is very quick. Um, we've had to keep challenging our government about, they say that if we have um, non-state torture law, that we're gonna create an international incident. So we've just said to them, well, all these other situations have occurred. It's male violence in the private sphere, and um, these have been adjudicated in different regions, and it hasn't created an international incident. So we've had to keep fighting with our government in Canada. So our case for a legally binding human rights treaty, our, I'll share our experience. Do you know what shadow reports are? Okay. Um, so if you're a member of the United Nations, countries have to report, for instance, Canada, they are, um, they've ratified uh, CEDA, uh, the Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So they have to report every four years or so. Canada has been every eight years, more or less. Um, and when the country goes to the UN to report, they're supposed to tell the committee, um, okay, you told me, Jody, to explain it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so when the country goes to report to the CEDAW committee, they tell the CEDAW committee, this is what it's like in Canada. And if you write a shadow report as an NGO, you go there and say, we don't agree. So Linda and I, representing an NGO, said we don't agree with what Canada is saying because they won't criminalize non-state torture, only state torture. So we're saying that's a human right violation and it's discriminatory and it should be changed. So CEDA, when they wrote back to Canada, they didn't say to Canada that Canada should make uh, change their law. So then in 2015, we talked to the chair of the uh, CEDAW committee and she, we said, what do we do? She said, well, submit another shadow report. Is that gonna help? She said it might. So in 2016, another one shadow report went. The question was asked, but still the CEDAW committee didn't recommend to Canada to do anything. So we're caught. There's nothing we can do. Like she just said, it's soft law. They don't, our Canada can just dismiss it. So the same thing happened in 2012 with the Committee Against Torture. Only the Committee Against Torture did support us and said, yes, Canada should change their law, but it's based on their general comment number two and it's soft law. So we're lost again there. So that's why we're supporting uh, from our experience. And the women at the bottom, it's invisibilization. You know, if we don't, if they don't, if we don't recognize non-state torture, if we don't criminalize it, if we don't talk about it, they're caught, they're kind of caged into the invisibility. Very quickly, um, sustainable development goals, you know what they are? Yes? Okay, gender equality, we've taken the Universal Declaration, Article 5, and said, okay, uh, the global target number five to end all forms of violence against women and girls. They match up. You can't say some people have the right to be protected against torture and some can uh, not. And the same thing goes uh, again for the um, uh, sustainable development goals, the 16, 5, and 10. If we're, not gonna, if we're really intent on leaving no one behind, mm -hmm. then we have to include torture by non-state actors. Now, every woman everywhere that, do you want to talk about that? Okay, I'll let, I'll, I'll let Jackie talk about that. Now, uh, Jody, um, when we talked on, on um, Skype, you said to bring a project. So I don't know, you have quite a big project. So this is uh, women's stat. Do you know about women's stat? Anybody know about women's stat? 
So this is a project that started quite a few years ago. Um, it's out of the uh, Texas University, and they look at the global issues um, that affect women because they've, um, Valerie Hudson, which we talked to her quite a few years ago when she wrote her book, and the whole idea that the fate of nations is tied to the status of women and what Rashida said, you know, if we don't have law, if we don't have state accountability, we are in, di in difficulty because it's a, an epidemic for sure. So they have uh, 45 maps of different things like physical security of women, uh, bride price, women's mobility. But what they don't have is um, a, a map on torture by non-state actors. So I don't know if that's a project. Linda and I have tried to do something with it, but <laughs> we get too busy. So I don't know if in the future that might be something that you might uh, consider or students might consider uh, because it's a way of producing data because governments will say there's no data. But of course, if you don't have a law, you don't have data either. And if you have soft law, it disappears again. So it might be a way to kind of challenge state States to say, okay, you need to have a law on non-state torture. So, very quickly, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sarson. Um, and just so you know, I did account for everybody to go a few minutes over. <laughs> so, um, so right now, where some of you already know her, Professor Jody Rory is here. She's also from the Latin American Studies Department and her area of expertise is violence against women and the Caribbean. Um, so thank you, thank you, um, Gabriela, for um, just doing a great job at moderating this panel. I'm going to grab my water. Sorry. I've <clears throat> been talking a lot. Um, so it's an honor for me to be here with all of you, ladies, strong, mujeres poderosas. Um, so thank you for that, for, for letting me be here with all of you. Um, and I really mean that because I listen to you and I feel so empowered. Um, and I know this is a tough subject to listen to, but as I'm sitting here, I'm talking to Gabriela and I'm listening to your presentation, we were thinking of, there's a place in Puerto Rico that uh, some of us might know, it's Parada 18 in Santurce. And I think of the vulnerable trans population there that's heavily trafficked in human trafficking um, and how vulnerable now they are, much more manifested, that vulnerability is much more manifested because of the hurricane. And it's not only trans kids, it's just that trans kids are a more vulnerable population um, just because of the simple fact that they are trans. Um, so um, I just want to kind of point that out. So I, I have some students that were working with me. I don't know if Gio, did she leave? Gio, could you stand up? Do I have any other students here that work with me on the webpage? Okay, so Giamari Sanchez was one of the students that worked with me on the webpage. So I just want to say thank you, Gio. <clears throat> Jessica Tiburcio is not here. Melanie Monroy, Natalie Ramirez, and Magdalena Oropesa is not here. So I, I want to start my presentation by saying um, and I kind of wrote this statement out because my voice is hoarse. Um, natural disasters render women, especially rural women, uh, which is the topic of CSW 62, more vulnerable to violence, especially domestic violence and interpersonal inter, um, violence. And in the case of Puerto Rico, especially post Hurricane Maria, um, not being able to easily access um, temporary restraining orders post hurricane due to the circumstances that I'm gonna share with you compounds the violence that women experience, especially in rural areas and not having shelters accessible to them or a sufficient number of shelters accessible to them exasper exacerbates the violence. Um, giving the US Supreme Court ruling on the Jessica Lenahan case and the inability to access domestic remedies despite the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights ruling because of the United States aversion to international law, combined with the facts, the fact that the US has not signed CEDAW makes it so that the lack of a treaty compounds women's vulnerability even more, more so given Puerto Rico's colonial status, hence making the need for a new treaty this much more necessary to fill the normative gap that Rashida talks to even more real, and that need is now. For us, it is very much now. 
So I want to turn to data, right? I'm, I, I studied law, but I'm a social scientist. And so what I spend my time doing is trying to collect data because, as you quite blatantly pointed out, if we don't have the data, we can't make the case. So post-Hurricane Maria, the numbers that we can gather, because Puerto Rico does not have a Freedom of Information Act, so you cannot readily gain access to data without a court order if it's not given to you. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. It's not like in a lot of the states here, okay? So in order to get the data, which I was able to get, um, some of the data I'm going to share with you. Uh, we know that post-Hurricane Maria, uh, during the emergency period, there were 442 temporary restraining orders issued. That is a preliminary report by FEMA. That's an exorbitant amount of data report, I mean, an exorbitant amount of temporary restraining orders. And those are temporary restraining orders that were issued when the court wasn't fully functioning and when there was a lack of telecommunications, right? So people weren't able to pick up the phone because there weren't telecommunication um, uh, phone, cell phones available, right? You couldn't, they didn't, simply didn't function. Um, and courts weren't accessible. People didn't have cars because either the car was wrecked by the hurricane or the streets, you know, there, were no, there was no street lights. And there were other obstacles that made that impossible. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Another thing, another part of the data that I can share with you are 9-11 calls. 9-11 calls that did make it through, right, through the few people that did have access, um, from September 20th to the 30th of 2017, there were, um, according to the 9-11 line that we were able to access, there were 211 calls. After Hurricane Maria in October 2017, that number spiked to, to 889 9-11 calls related to domestic violence. These are just domestic violence calls. If we look at the data in, from November 2nd to the 21st, there were two, 647 calls for a total of 1,747 911 calls related to domestic violence from September to November. I requested the data for the previous year, but I haven't gotten it yet. So and again, we don't have a Freedom of Information Act. I might have to file right to get that information. I haven't gotten it yet. Now, I want to preface what I'm going to share with you about the shelters with the stories of the victims that I was able to meet and talk to while I was in Puerto Rico. Right now, we have 10 women that have been reported disappeared since Maria. We don't know where they are, right? And the women's movement is actively trying to get the state to figure this out, right? To recognize these women as disappeared. Let's talk about Sandra. Sandra is 84 years old. She lives in a rural town in Aguadilla. She was trafficked by her daughter. She was sold for sex by her daughter. Her case, um, she had a temporary restraining order, and I found her in a elderly, the only elderly violence shelter where the elderly face issues of violence in a town called Arecibo. Arecibo was where the earth, Hurricane Maria left the island. They haven't had water and electricity since Irma. Do you, do you understand that? Since Irma in September. And they have elderly people with medical needs in that shelter, and we are in March. That's about six months out. Then I met Olga. Olga is in the same shelter, but Olga's story is different. She's 83 years old. Her husband beat her. He was, she was with him for 30 years. She has no family. She has no children to depend on. He kicks her out of the home before the hurricane. She f faces the hurricane, goes to a friend ha friend's house. The friend says, listen, I can't take care of you. I have to deal with the hurricane myself. You got to go because I don't have any provisions to deal with you. So now the victim is re-victimized, right? She walks from her house to another town that is very, very far away to an elderly home that she finds where she's nice, fortunate enough to meet a social worker. The social worker takes her, finds a shelter in another town called Mayagüez, which is hours away, and calls the police and says, you need to transport this domestic violence victim to this domestic violence shelter. And the police officer says, we aren't going to do that. We can't provide you that support, Post Maria. You need to do it in your own car. Thankfully, that social worker is nice enough to take that victim to that shelter. That shelter is, uh, director is awesome enough to realize that that lady has medical needs that necessitate this elderly violence shelter, which gives this woman 
Olga, which is a pseudo name, six months in a shelter as opposed to the three months in the domestic violence shelter that she has under Volkan Bauer funds. Let's talk about Sofia, the undocumented Venezuelan immigrant who marries her Puerto Rican husband who says he's going to give her status and doesn't give her status, right? He then traps her into this very big cycle of violence, economic, psychological, totally physical abuse, impregnates her, beats the child out of her. Then she's abused by her mother-in-law, who tells her after he beats her to a pulp as she's bleeding, miscarrying her baby, says, you need to endure this because I endured it for 25 years. When she goes to her Catholic priest for help, he says, this is the cross you must bear. When she goes to court, after she talks to a friend who gets her out of the cycle of violence, the attorney for her husband blames her for the death of, his, of her mother-in-law, who happened to die during the arrest of the aggressor. This is what's going on in Puerto Rico. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is, after I'm meeting this and dozens of other victims that are vi being victimized and re-victimized through the cycle of justice, right, um, we have a problem. The problem is that we start originally in Puerto Rico with 11 shelters. Beautiful, right? We think this might be adequate for an island with 3.4 million people. Because we have to also recognize that not only women are victims of violence, right? We know that there's a small percentage of men that report their violence as well. Well, what happens pre-hurricane is that there are three shelters that are closed. One of them provides ambulatory services in the rural south. Three shelters are closed. Post Hurricane Maria, out of that, three more shelters are closed for a period of time, compounding the access that victims of violence have to safe havens to get help, right? So now we have two of those shelters that open for a period, now they're open, but for a period of time were closed. One of them is permanent closed because they've suffered infrastructure damage. So what's the issue post hurricanes Irma and Maria? The state accountability issue is a factor because the shelters are providing a state-sponsored service and they're not receiving local state funding because of some delay from the Department of Family who's supposed to give them funding that's insufficient, right? So we have this political process that's going on locally that's not funding them sufficiently. The VAWA funds and the VOCA funds that they are receiving don't allow them to pay essential services like the mortgage payment that they need to keep the building running, right? Which is why we created the website to give you an idea of what it is that they need. What happens during the hurricane and post-hurricane? The DV shelters don't have a phone. They don't have a way to communicate with any government agency. They're not given a phone until a month later after the hurricane. In some cases, they don't have a phone till today. So the general refugees that are, the general refugee shelters that are set up during the hurricane, for those shelters that were evacuated into those refugee shelters, some of them in the general refugee shelters they were never trained to deal with domestic violence victims. So there was no sponsored state protocol to deal with special victims. So there were shelters that I witnessed during the brigade that I did in October that they didn't deal with the um, victims properly. So what are some of the issues um, that we should be dealing with in terms of, or what are some of the other um, imposed obstacles? There was a government curfew that allowed you to not leave your home at six. So if you were a domestic violence victim, how were you going to access the court if you couldn't leave your house after six o'clock? If the courts weren't open because they were simply closed or there wasn't a court in your region, where were you going to go for a temporary restraining order? There was no state plan of action to include as stakeholders in an emergency management table the unmet needs of victims of violence during a natural disaster. And this is a global problem, not, need, not necessarily unique to Puerto Rico. So we need a treaty, we need a protocol to evacuate domestic violence victims in natural disasters, and we need all of these things that I'm telling you right now. Um, we need federal legislation to fill the normative gap in the United States, we need new international treaty to fill the normative gap just globally, and, I, and we need to um, do a lot more in terms of police discretion and immunity policies in, term, in, in Puerto Rico because we have the second largest police department in the United States, and that police department happens to be under federal monitorship for 
human rights violations. So I'm going to end it there, and hopefully we can talk a little bit during Q&A. Thank you, Professor Rory. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the floor over to our last panelist for the evening, Jackie Jones. She's a professor of feminist legal studies at the University of West England. Good evening, and thanks for staying, and thanks for coming, and thanks for listening to us. Really appreciate you being around. Is this better? Shall I stand there, guys? <laughs> you can tell I'm a teacher, can't you? Okay. Well, thank you very much for all your time and effort as well here, and um, Jody especially for everything you've done, and all of the students and all the inspiring work you do, and keep doing. She's really great, isn't she? Fantastic. I thought you were going to get clapped, but there we go. Enough of that. Okay. Yeah, enough of that. Yeah. Okay, so um, my job is to try and pull some of the themes together at the end. It's very difficult within five, ten minutes to do that, but I'll try my best, and um, I've added some as well, so bear with me. But I'm the last, and then you can ask questions. So uh, some of the things that I'd like to highlight um, are, first of all, state responsibility. All of the speakers were talking about state responsibility or irresponsibility of some kind or another. And trying to hold states to account is a very difficult job at times, especially at international level. But when you don't have any treaty at all or any international law that is uh, legally binding, then it's impossible, isn't it? So when you have soft law, yeah, you can say, hey, stop doing that. Come on, go on, get your act together. But you can't go to the court and say, they did that, come on, let's get some reparation going, get some money out of them to, to try and stop them from doing that again or not doing that, anything. So implementation as well is an issue, is it's a problematic area or a challenging area, as they say. Um, but that is the case for many different areas. Did I do something? <laughs> Kidding. Um, that is the, the case for many different things. There is no excuse to say that there's, it might be an implementation problem. Are you being sort of um, the shutters down? Are we here for the night or something? No? Okay. Um, so there's no excuse for saying that that's, um, you know, something that international law is something specific to international law. Not at all. It's the case for many different areas, as we've heard already, whether you have domestic laws or not. But if you do not have a law at, uh, at international level, you can't do any implementation at all. Uh, I think a an, an very important area is that um, making the uh, violence visible and heard at all levels, it doesn't matter where it is or what it is, is an extremely important point for not just victims and survivors, but also for those who hear the stories of victims and survivors. Um, it also hopefully means the lawmakers, those in positions of power, those who... Um, are the actors of impunity will get to hear what they're actually doing and eventually we hope that they will listen. And finally on this slide there is a symbiotic relationship between international law, regional law and um, domestic law. And you may not see it so much for human rights law in the United States but that doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist. So when we have an awful lot of these international treaties up here, if you can see them they're all uh, up here. So, for example, um, the ones that we were talking about are on the right hand side called CAT, the Convention uh, Against Torture, and CEDAW, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, they also have optional protocols, which means as an individual you can try and petition the courts, uh, the, the treaty bodies, and say, Oi, my rights have been violated. These things matter because they get translated into regional and domestic settings. And this is a diagram. Isn't it nice? It's pretty, isn't it? Um, my son did it. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, this is a di diagram to try and explain some of the symbiotic relationships that exist. So if you have an international law, what it does is it has regional, no it has international norms that can be translated further down the line. And if they're, go if they're good standards, then they can be transposed as well into domestic laws. And they can supplement as well the domestic law, which may be um, not as, as well developed. So you can supplement them or um, um, pass them as well. So all of these things matter because they translate into each other, because we're not an island, are we? Well, 
we're an island, but you're, you're not, I'm from the UK, but you're not an island really, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that you are going to read judgments from another legal jurisdiction. They can be transposed. You can use ideas. And um, the highest courts as well as the lowest courts do this all the time. You as police officers, law enforcement officers, I should say, are also able to do that, lawyers especially. You can come and you can talk to other people, other jurisdictions do it differently. The CSW, the Commission on Status of Women, why we're here now for the next two weeks, that's a perfect place to go. You don't need a badge to go into the United Nations. Come to the side events. They will, people from all over the world will tell you what their law is like and you can use those snippets. You can get the information from them in order to influence your own court cases, your own way of looking at how we use law. Does that make sense? Convinced? Good. Glad to hear it. Opening this drawer. Okay, I'm going fast. I'm sorry. All right. So what does the gap look like? We know that uh, domestic violence is not a crime, thanks to your, your research. It's not a crime in about six million, um, 600 million women's lives around the countries, uh, in, around the globe. Marital rape is not considered a crime in many, many different countries as well. And we know that um, the recognition of a wrong against us helps us retain or get our dignity. And that's extremely important. So we have, um, in some parts of the world, very weak regional systems, for example, in the Asian area, or I'm just talking about ending violence against women and girls, or in the African system. We can do better than that. The European system is pretty good at the moment, but not perfect because it has reservations against it already. But we can do much, much better than that, can't we? My standard is always, if we can send a probe to Mars, why can't we solve these issues? Might make sense, might not, I don't know. Okay, so we heard today from our panelists, uh, some of them, about non-state torture, very, very vividly and very difficultly, uh, about domestic violence cent centers and shelters that have very, very difficult situations that they have to deal with every single day. Um, not just, um, not, I would call them disaster areas, but not man-made disasters rather than natural disasters. I think they're man-made because it's cl climate change, right? And um, that there is state irresponsibility with regard to all of that because the state is not taking these things seriously at all. They would prefer to go out and um, party and do various things. The impunity, therefore, uh, exists and continues, and it's only through advocacy and standing up for individuals and for your own rights that we get somewhere close to um, enforceability. So grassroots have called for an international treaty to end violence against women and girls or an optional protocol. Now, in our previous presentation in the morning, we had Vidya, um, who's a co-founder of a organi grassroots organization called Every Woman Everywhere campaign. Oh, there you are. You're here as well. And um, that organization has over, what, 1,400 organizations and individuals that have signed up for it, calling for an international treaty. So grassroots meaning different people in different parts of the globe have been um, asked, do you think we need a treaty or do we not? There's a sign-up sheet down there. Um, there's also an academic call for a specific treaty to end violence against women and girls or an optional protocol. Rashida and I have co-edited um, the academic book. If you'd like a brochure about it, then uh, there you go. There's an e-book that's a lot cheaper, so don't be put off by, by the price, please. So there, there has been a lot and a lot of calls about it. Now, a lot of people would say, give, give push, pushback about that because they say the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is, is fine. Why don't we just use that? That convention is about ending discrimination. It only has one article about violence in it. But it also has soft law, general recommendations, and there's quite a few on different aspects of forms of violence. But again, it's soft law, so you can't really go to the states and say, oi, stop what you're doing, you nasty, nasty people, or else. Uh, but you can with a, with a law, with a treaty, because it's a normative instrument. There have been some cases that have been brought before the CEDAW committee, but there are very few, actually, when you uh, do the numbers. And it's not good enough. And all of that, to me, says that there's an inability of CEDAW to effectively manage um, violence against women or do something effective against them. 
So what, why we're calling for a new treaty on optional protocol to CEDAW or op, um, with its own monitoring mechanism is because we need the specifics of the types of prevalent forms of violence that um, are out there enunciated, written down in a document for the globe, not just for certain regions or certain countries. It, it would promote uniformity in the definitions because definitions are problematic in different uh, countries and that way you slip through the net. It promotes state response, accountability and responsibility, complete and adequate standards. Okay. It has to focus on human rights-based approach, not necessarily a criminal justice approach, I would suggest, because what we need is prevention services for women, adequately funded, uh, access to justice, etc., and inclusive of all women and girls around the globe for the 21st century because we don't have any document really that talks about online violence and all those kinds of forms that exist and are very prevalent um, at the moment. So what we're trying to do is promote clarity and um, a um, uniformity of approach for all of these things. Right, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about, and I'll do it in a minute, is that there have been a huge, uh, there's been a huge amount of efforts for several years now to get uh, a movement going about uh, trying to get a treaty. Now, um, I think it was in 2011 that you called for a treaty. I, th I think that was about right, I'm, I'm not sure. And since then, we've drafted a treaty. We've had um, an organization set up, everyone everywhere. But we've also had many different regional conferences um, that have taken place, both in the USA, South, South Africa, and the UK, continental Europe, even in the USA as well. Um, SCSW has had at least 25, 30 panels talking about it. Um, so there's a grassroots and also an academic um, swing towards it. Now, um, what I would say in, in closing is that the responses to all of this stuff uh, have been incredible. And I use the word incredible on purpose because it hides both positive and negative aspects or responses that have happened. A lot of them have been positive, by, uh, especially by individuals who have suffered something that is not articulated elsewhere. They want a redress and they want it written down. They want to be recognized for it and something needs to happen in order for individuals to be able to live a dignified life. Right. Um, and um, I think that um, the, um, I think we're getting somewhere because the negative response is that the arguments against the treaty have been recorded finally. We're not being ignored anymore. We were at the start. But they're now being recorded and something has happened, like the Special Rapporteur trying to shut down the conversations by gathering or sucking up responses and hiding them because she had said originally she was going to put it on the website. I don't think the civil society responses are on there. I just think the institutional responses are on there, which she called them. Yeah. Um, so I think we actually have a momentum right now. It has a life and it has a momentum. And I hope that you will join this global movement to speak up and speak out to ensure we use the granted imperfect systems in order to move forward towards a state of equal justice, equal dignity and equality for all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that overview of everything. It was great. Um, I want to take this moment uh, to open Q&A. I think I tried my best. I, we only went over by like nine minutes, which is much better than I thought it would be. Um, so we have approximately 20, 25 minutes for question and answer. Uh, students, remember that we have, they're all experts. This is your moment. There you have scholars, uh, lawyers, you have uh, social workers up here, so anything, just feel free. Okay, so if you have questions, just stand up, say your name, and let us know. Hi guys, my name is Katie um, Munoz, and I am a student at John Jay College. Um, my major is Law and Society, as a, I raised my hand before when you asked, what do, we, what do you guys want to be? I, rest, I raised my hand as I want to be a lawyer. Um, I know about this, um, amazing panel today because of Ron Brown program, which is one of the programs that I'm really interested in joining. Hopefully, I just have my interview. 
we'll see. <laughs> and um, I just want to thank you all, you guys, for being here and especially sharing your stories and the work, the amazing work that you have done for our amazing world, which sometimes is not as amazing, but we should rejoice it regardless of all the problems that there is right now. Um, and this is coming from a wannabe lawyer. <laughs> Anyway, uh, my question was for Professor Rory. Um, kind of explain to us a little bit in regards of what inspired you to do this amazing work for Puerto Rico. Um, because we know that Puerto Rico is a nation, is a, a nation part of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's being disregarded as nothing, as just a piece of land. And me, myself, come from a Caribbean country which is a third, is a, considered a third world country, which is the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And regardless of me being a lawyer here in the United States, I would like to take my knowledge, my efforts that I take from this amazing country um, to my country, to my own. So, please, thank you. Thank you for your question. And yes, we are um, considering you for the Ron Brown program. <laughs> I'm sorry for my voice. This is what happens when you talk a lot. <clears throat> um, if I had been in any part of the world and a natural disaster of this impact had hit it, I would have reacted the same way. So it doesn't really mean that it would have happened in Puerto Rico. It would have happened in any place. I would have reacted the same way. Um, and if I hadn't been caught in the natural disaster, I would have reacted in the same way. I just happened to be caught in the natural disaster in both Irma and Maria and happened to be living in Puerto Rico at the time. Um, and so what I want everybody to understand that Puerto Rico is a very diverse set of islands. So it consists of Puerto Rico, Culebra, and Vieques. So it's not only one island. And there are over 30 different consulates, I think, right? About 30 consulates represented there. There are transient people that live there, and there is a large popula population of undocumented immigrants that live there as well. A lot of undocumented Dominican immigrants live in Puerto Rico. Um, and they are the most vulnerable population there. Um, and there's a lot of issues of race that aren't addressed in Puerto Rico that make racial, popu race, racial populations um, more vulnerable because we don't address the issues of race. So I think um, that the natural disaster compounds the, that, that all of those issues are compounded by a natural disaster and how certain communities are um, approached after a disaster depends on the intersectionality of race, class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, economic status, and I can keep going on with the list. So I can bring everybody in this panel and find somebody in Puerto Rico that will represent every single race, everything that we represent on this panel. Um, and so right now, what's interesting is in the hurricane relief efforts that I'm working with, I'm working with people from India. I'm working with people from um, faith-based organizations, non-faith-based organizations. Every partner that I never thought I would work with, I'm working with to help for the overall recovery of the three islands, Puerto Rico, Culebra, and Vieques. So I think what's most important is the human rights perspective. When you see a violation of human rights and you can use your influence to gather powerful human beings, as in this case, women, to help you advocate for a human rights issue without a question, right? They don't even question you. Yes, we are here, what do we need to do? That for me is amazing, right? That they come together to help us advocate and bring this forth at CSW, that Rashida from her time for free will come and take from her personal time, her professional time, to come to Puerto Rico to see and to help and go advocate, go forth, and that Jackie and, and Jeanette, everybody, Jeanette, Jeannie, Linda, everybody, right, and Gabriela, that we all work together 
to then come again later on. And I know if I say to them anything, they will say, yep, we're going to help you do that. That to me is like, right? That, that's, that's what this is about. So it's not only me, right? So I, I want you to understand that it's all of us and it's all of you because the fact that you're sitting here at 8.19, right, and you had a long day and you all work, all of my students work, right, and they go to school. This is not a traditional campus. So the fact that you work, you go to school, and you have family responsibilities, and you're sitting here to educate yourselves and to understand what you, sh what you could be doing to help people that are in need. And in our case, we're talking about women that are in the most vulnerable situation right now in a part of the United States, you know? Thank you for being here. Uh, hello, my name is Shannon. I'm a student at John Jay College, and I'm also part of the Ron H. Brown program. Um, my question is for anybody who wants to answer. Um, like me and a lot of the people in here, I want to be an attorney. And what kind of work do you want to see specifically from attorney, attorneys and law enforcement officials to help further your goals in ending violence against women or making a world a better place for victims to speak about the experiences they have? Excuse me. For me, um, I think number one is understanding the extent of the violence that can occur. And to concretize that, if you have that wisdom, what comes to my mind, um, teaching first responders. Uh, we had a situation where a woman um, who was non-state tortured, she was just 23, I think, um, and she went into a flashback and ended up in the bathroom hiding behind the toilet. And the two policemen that came, um, they were very angry and they were misogynistic and drug her out of the bathroom and it triggered her more. So the same woman on another occasion was on a bus uh, going home. This was in Alberta province in Canada. And she heard a car backfire and that triggered her into thinking uh, into a flashback. Um, so she ran into her house when the bus stopped and called the police because she said there were perpetrators coming to get her. So when those policemen came it, there was snow on the ground, and they said to her, well, come outside. We only see your steps. We don't see anybody else. So they had some empathy there and some caring and some wisdom, obviously. And when they could show her that it was just her footsteps out there, that brought her out of the flashback and allowed her to start connecting in the here and now. So that's... That kind of empathy comes with having the information that you've received today, having the wisdom to um, kind of ask the right questions, to look at the person as a human being and maybe uh, understand uh, what they may, may be experiencing. So that's a, a concrete way of understanding. And what, another example that comes, Linda and I were teaching um, a class of uh, expecting lawyers. And one woman, uh, one of the students said to us, well, why are you telling us this de these details? But if you don't have the details, how are you going to understand the person you're trying to defend? So I, I, that's how I would answer that with uh, the issue of knowledge and understanding fully. I can give another example. Um, we had a lawyer from the United States contact Jean and I. Uh, a young woman had uh, escaped from Canada and she wanted amnesty because she was not safe in her own country of Canada. And she was presenting with very what the lawyer would call bizarre behavior. But she, instead of judging her, she tried to understand what that behavior, behavior really meant. For example, she came in with, I think it was a carrot, wasn't it? In her vagina? Yeah, she had a carrot. No, she had a small bottle. A small in her bottle. Vagina. Okay, a small bottle. And, 
you know, so I guess some lawyers would think that she's mentally ill. But this lawyer called us and asked, you know, what, what, what's going on here? And actually, she had been raped so much that it was, it was a normal state for her to have something in her vagina, and it was a way of stabilizing herself. So she started looking at her differently and started understanding her case, and she was able to uh, argue and get amnesty for her. So if you don't understand, and, and how they tell their stories too, they don't tell them in clear, consequential uh, statements. So it, it takes a while to get a story from them as well for their testimony. That's just an example. Um, in, in Kentucky, uh, I work with uh, supporters, uh, legislators there. Uh, many legislators in different states are attorneys, okay? So forwarding and supporting legislation that changes some of this is, is something that you can do. Even if you're not a legislator, support those, or when someone asks you to support a bill, that you in fact call your legislative hotline and get behind it and say, I want this passed. Uh, one of my colleagues, we've, um, we're going to pass uh, a child marriage bill in the state of Kentucky. It's already passed, the Kentucky Senate. Uh, <clears throat> Kentucky has the third highest rate of child marriage in the United States, so it looks like that's going to pass. Uh, the Kentucky Senate, 83 to 0, passed uh, a resolution supporting SESTA, stopping online sex trafficking. It's basically like Backpage.com, where a lot of facilitated human trafficking and uh, prostitution, including children, uh, occurs. So um, we lobbied for that, and they're supporting that bill. It's already passed the U.S. Uh, Senate. It will next go to the House. It looks like there's enough votes <coughs> for that to pass. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my friend, after hearing Gina Linda on torture, said, hey, you know, we need to go ahead and get a piece of legislation going in Kentucky concerning torture. There are only two states in the United States, that's California and Michigan, that have um, laws against torture. Think of that. So you can basically torture the hell out of somebody, and there's no law that covers that. So um, that's one thing uh, we'll do. So I, I believe in forwarding legislation. I believe in forwarding treaties. And uh, I think that's something you can do. Um, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that when you go to your law school, um, you can ask the programs there that they bring in guest lecturers who, um, were you going to say the same thing? Okay. Um, I do that on all the courses that, that I teach. I mean, uh, trusts in the UK, where, where I teach, is uh, not antitrust like you have here, but it's equity. And I used to teach it from a feminist perspective. So the family home, how, how do you get a piece in the family home if you aren't married to a person? You know, that kind of thing. So I think choosing your law school well as well and, and ha making a fuss about it. I don't really, you know... Um, we need to have um, a guest lecturer on this because I don't understand the responses because I've learned at the CSW that people respond differently. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be women only or girls or violence. You know, it, does, it doesn't matter what subject it is. Yeah? So, I mean, you can have corporate social responsibility lectures in your corporate law uh, classes as well. So it's universal thing. Yeah? And when you have a refusal or a, or a resistance from your law school because you might be attending a law school that might be conservative on the matter, you run for student bar association president or you run for president of organization and you hold the event yourself, right? And you supplement. And so you hold these monthly events like we run the Ron Brown speaker series like you're holding right now to supplement what you're not learning in the classroom. Well, one, one other thing, when you all are um, looking at all this, be sure that you've read this. How many of you all have actually 
know about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Raise your hands. We've got uh, quite a few. The rest of you, you need to get this and, and familiarize yourself with it uh, because this is the foundation along with uh, whatever, especially in the United States, the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution and this document as well as CETA, which the U.S. has never ratified, okay, that uh, you inform yourself with this and use this tool. You know, don't, don't, when you have these cases, don't accept no. You know, keep, go, keep going and start using this. You'll get further than you ever thought you could. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. I think for those of you that eventually go into practice, whatever it is, law enforcement, um, policing, prosecution, etc. One of the things is that you are able, because you have to interpret and implement the law, you are able to then think about what's the normative gap here, and you can play an instrumental role in notifying the legislature, the executive, that this isn't an issue uh, that can be ignored, that you can't, as a law enforcement person, do your job because there's a normative gap. So if there's no specificity in the law on non-state torture, you have a role and you have a responsibility, right, to notify the legislature, uh, to deal with the executive about the normative gap. And the, the interpreters and the implementers of the law, we shouldn't just leave it to judges. We can't always trust them. But the, the, you know, the policeman that comes to the door um, can say, well, there's no domestic violence law. There's a normative gap in our domestic system, and what do we do? And you're able to do that because your job is not just about well, what can I use? Can I use a criminal re remedy? Can I use a civil remedy? If there's no remedy, then it, there's a responsibility to say there is no remedy and what can I do about it? And that's very powerful because the interpreter and the implementer of the law is able to say, I can't do my job, my hands are tied because there isn't a remedy that, uh, that I can use uh, and access. And I'm not gonna make do by saying I can use some other legislation that might fly it won't fly in court. Judges are going to throw it out. So that's an important role as well. After passing the treaty, how would this help victims that are like vulnerable? In terms of, let's say in Texas, how there's so many runaways that, are, that get into the human trafficking or immigrant women who are taken advantage of and don't understand that they have rights to citizenship or just resources that they can access or um, during the disaster relief. I mean, during disaster, after the hurricane disaster, like when there's no access to communication or like, or just other third world countries and like accessing, um, like how do you even get, like how would they be able to, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, Fine. Yeah. I mean, seek remedies. I think the one thing that we all should take away is that human rights do not get suspended because there's a disaster, there's a humanitarian crisis. In fact, the state has a greater responsibility. So it's about state responsibility, right? Because human rights don't get suspended despite conflicts, etc. And unfortunately, we live in a world where in a crisis, you know, we, we kind of go into humanitarian mode and we forget that human rights is part and parcel of our response that we should be thinking. So state responsibility means that whether it's a crisis, whether it's a disaster of some sort, that the human rights of people need to be recognized. So if there's a global treaty with clearly indicating what state responsibilities are, it won't clearly say, well, you have to do this for victims, you have to have this policy, etc. International law doesn't do that. It doesn't micromanage that. There is a sense of state sovereignty. But what it does, it creates a normative framework of standards that a state needs to in then interpret into their domestic situation through laws, policies, programs, allocation of budgets, etc. And that's again part of state responsibility and it's about accountability, how states do that. So for the person on the ground who needs that remedy, 
it is about access to information, right? So, you know, in South Africa, I was part of the team that drafted our domestic violence legislation. And one of the things we put in, and you know, there was a judge in our committee who was also part of the drafting team, was kicking and screaming about the kind of things we wanted in the law, including definitions. What is psychological violence? What is sexual violence? So that the person who's gonna interpret and implement, and that's really crucial, understands, because they come from a different background, their context, their reality. You talk about financial abuse and someone says, what the hell are you talking about, right? But a victim of domestic violence understands very well what financial abuse is. So we were asking to put all this, these definitions into legislation, which we did get. But one of the things we insisted, that when um, a victim of domestic violence or sexual violence either calls the police or goes to a police station, the police officer had a mandatory obligation to provide her with information about what the criminal law remedies were, what the civil law remedies were, and to assist her to fill in the relevant forms for her civil remedy. So we created a mandatory obligation on the police to do that. And then we knew we can create an obligation on paper, but how do we then enforce it? So we put in a provision that every six months, the police had to report to parliament, to the legislature, about the implementation of this legislation. So they could come and say, these are the challenges in interpretation and implementation, but parliament could then question them. This is a legislative arm, right, of our, of our government, could question them. Then we went further and we said that they had to disclose how many policemen were uh, domestic violence or sexual violence offenders. They had to disclose, because you didn't want people like this now being part of interpreting and implementing the law. So there are these things that once you create a legally binding instrument, then it's about how do, does a state at a national level understand what state responsibility means? How, what are the systems you need to put in place around state accountability? And it can be done. We might not immediately see the benefits of a legally binding treaty, but it is about, because it isn't an event to get a treaty. It's a process. And even when you get it adopted at an international level, it's not perfect because the horse trading at the international level goes on about what should be in treaties, what shouldn't be in treaties. Because states don't want accountability at the level that we are asking for and demanding. So it is about a process that, and then we see how does this uh, translate into your national level. One of the things that always concerned me in my six years as the rapporteur was that there would be this amazing, vibrant civil society engagement uh, with me when I presented my reports in Geneva, in New York, etc. And you know, the question always for me was, what happens when these people go back home? How do they bridge that global, local divide? Do they go back and report reporting to your own constituency on what you did in New York during the two weeks of CSW is one thing. But how do you then take that to your government and hold them accountable because of what you're hearing and seeing? And you know that's the other thing, is the global to the local, the local to the global. Because when we come to the CSW, there are people that come because they wanna hear what the local experiences are. But at the same time, we need to bring the local back home. Um, and I think there's a way of doing that and we need to, it's hard work, it's like, um, what's the saying about democracy? It's about eternal vigilance. There's never gonna be a perfect system. We all have to be vigilant about protecting a de a democracy and the principles and democratic spaces. It's the same in the human rights world, you know? It's so easy to lose the little gains that we've had and particularly on women's human rights. Because imagine sitting with a treaty from 1979, right? I mean, I laughingly say to my students, what would a treaty look like if we drafted a new treaty on women's rights? What would we include? And I think it's a good exercise. Maybe Jody should do the exercise with the students. So I would like to conclude our session by thanking our distinguished panelists for their expertise and insights on this very important topic. Um, I hope we have more opportunities like this to, and to expand our partnerships um, to abolish 
hopefully, uh, I'm gonna be very hopeful here, violence against women by the implemented UN 2030 agenda, at least as much as possible. It has been a very enlightening conversation and exchange. Um, I know our audience and particularly our students have been inspired by you guys and uh, all the work that you've done. Um, thank you for the students, NGOs, and special guests here tonight. And I wanna say a very special thanks to David Aviles, uh, Jose Bernal, Magdalena Oropesa, Melanie Monroy, Jomari Sanchez, Shannon Charreta, Jose Luis Morin for their time and effort on all the work put behind the scenes. Um, but I also want to thank the DV shelters, so domestic violence shelters in Puerto Rico for getting us this data that has been very hard because uh, the, I guess the government isn't doing it. So civil society has been has the need to do this. So Vilma Gonzalez Castro, Listel Flores Parguer, Vilmari Rivera, Sandra Cruz, Olga Villa, Gloria Vasquez Melendez, Silvia Silva Soto, Oralis Ortiz, and Luz Ortiz. And also for the student council, Fatim Oruchi, Steven Pacheco, and Melinda Yam, and Maria Jose Martinez for, uh, again, allowing us to have this event. Okay, thank you so much. And students, if you want to, I encourage you to come to the front and take a picture uh, with us. And we also have some sign-in sheets, so if you haven't done so yet, we have them right there in front, so make sure to sign them before you leave. Thank you.